Rebuilding a Tangy model steam engine. Part 1. Having a look at the design of the engine. And before anyone asks me why is it called a Tangy engine, I would just suggest that you Google the word Tangy. Usually, Tangy engines have the crosshead trunk guide, the main bearing, and the support for the engine itself cast as one unit. And this makes a very rigid assembly. On this particular Tangy engine, the valve timing is a little bit off and steam has not been admitted until the piston is well on its way back. And although it seems to run OK, it's making a bit of a knocking noise. And most of this mechanical clunking noise is down to the fact that the timing is out. There's some play in the big end, there's some play in the small end, and as the admission is very late, it's a sudden change in direction of the parts that makes the noise. Well, most of it anyway. When I lift the engine off my bench, the noise becomes a lot less. That's because on my bench, the entire top of it is a soundboard. And this is intentional, so that I can hear the mechanical noises that engines make. It's still making a noise, even when I suspend it in the air. When I put the engine back on the bench, the sound is amplified. If you listen beyond the clunking noise, the beats are quite even at each end of the cylinder. And once again, if I lift the engine off the soundboard, you can hear that the exhaust beats are quite even. These small tangy engines use a slightly different method to set the valve timing. The eccentric is part of the flywheel, so all you have to do is rotate the flywheel slightly relative to the crank pin. You may be thinking, why does this engine need a rebuild? It looks okay, and indeed it does. Bit of play in the big end, bit of play in the small end, but apart from that it's alright. So, I'm not going to do anything with this engine. I think it's perfectly okay as it is. Instead, this is the engine that I'm going to be working on. And this one runs almost silently, mainly due to the fact that it doesn't have a connecting rod or a piston. And if it did have a connecting rod and a piston, it still wouldn't work because the cylinder end cap is missing. And unfortunately, someone's drilled a hole in the middle of the cylinder to fit this lubricator. And because of this hole midway down the cylinder, using a piston ring made from silicone is out of the question. Every time the piston ring passes the hole, some more of it will be planed away. This engine is pretty horrible, but I'm not complaining because Simon at the steam workshop gave it to me. I'd asked Simon several times about this engine, and he was non-committal, he didn't really know what it was. But eventually he just said, here take it, Merry Christmas. As a general assessment of the engine, it really is not too bad. It looks horrible, I know. The flywheel run out is down to a minimum. I'm putting the pulley in the bin. I'm going to make another one of those. It looks to me like the person who built this engine was not the same person who made the pulley. In common with the first engine that I showed in the video, the basic design is good because it's exactly the same model. The base is cast iron and the other cast parts are made from gunmetal, or maybe brass. Here are both of the engines together, and as you can see, they came from the same place. Well, the same foundry anyway. I'm sure some viewers will know what this is. Is it an Edgar T. Westbury design? I'm not sure. But if you know what it is, please don't hesitate to let me know. All the fixings on this engine are set screws, or cheese head bolts, whatever you want to call them. And the pin through the valve fork is also a cheese head bolt, and this is not a good idea. I'll make a proper pin for this when I put it back together. Well, the valve face looks okay, and the port face looks alright as well. I was wondering whether this was a commercial item, but I do notice slight differences between the two engines. I'm just pleased that there's a valve in there, because at first I thought, I wonder what's inside the steam chest. The port face is in good condition too. Because the cylinder is part of the main casting, you can see to the left on the port face there's a plugged hole. This is not a mistake, it's the way the steam way into the cylinder has been drilled. I'll just give the port face a bit of a clean with a cloth to see what condition it's in. And the good news is it's in pretty good condition. It's a bit oil stained and it's been stood for a long time. The surface of the port face under the grime is in good condition. Further bearing out the evidence that more than one person worked on this engine is this mess underneath the cylinder. This is soft solder. It's the way the exhaust pipe's been soldered in. I can't live with this. It's got to go. So it's into the outer part of the workshop, and I'm going to use my blow lamp to melt the solder, after which I'll be able to brush it away with this old paintbrush. Passing the paintbrush through the flame like this is not a good idea. 
This is not lack of synchronicity on my part, it's just stupidity. A quick touch with a brass wire brush and it's now fairly clean. And I can see that there is a thread down in the hole, so obviously whoever worked on it didn't have the facility to thread a piece of pipe, so it was easy just to put a piece of pipe in there and soft solder it. I'm going to use a 90 degree elbow at this point and make a proper exhaust system. In the next episode I'll be dismantling this engine completely, but for the moment I need to leave it on the vise for it to cool down. That's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.